So welcome to Mining Explained. You guys are in great hands today. The, our next trainer is an expert, a long time uh, crypto space aficionado. He's uh, really well respected around the world. I'm super happy to be able to introduce him today. He has a BS in electrical engineering and computer science from UC Berkeley. He's the CEO and co-founder of Edge, a non-custodial exchange and security platform for blockchain educations, which has won accolades, including, but not limited to, being one of the top Bitcoin mobile apps, receiving first place at the Inside Bitcoin 2015 and Coin Agenda 2016 pitch competitions, and being voted in the top 50 fintech companies to watch. So please help me welcome Paul Puey. Okay, mic check, everyone hear me okay? Big thumbs up, cool. So mining basics, how many people are actually looking to do mining themselves? Okay, only one person, good, because most of you then came to the right talk. I'm not gonna teach you what to do to mine. I'm gonna teach you what exactly mining is. What is the purpose of mining on the network? Uh, what's its benefits? And some aspects, a little touch a little bit on the aspects of what it does to kind of the general global power grid and economy. So mining serves two primary purposes. <clears throat> Number one, it's the issuance of the currency out to the network. So we call it mining because it has this analogy to mining precious metals and gold. And when you mine gold, you actually expend energy, whether that be money to pay people, money to buy equipment, or the electricity needed to actually operate the heavy earth-moving equipment. And that effectively finds the gold. So with cryptocurrency mining, you know, obviously starting with Bitcoin, that same analogy applies. You're expending energy to find or discover the currency. And the people that expend the most energy are the people that effectively get the, the currency. But the part where the analogy breaks down of mining is the fact that mining is actually the way to secure the network. It's the way that transactions that are broadcast by senders and to some degree, I guess, recipients to verify is secured by mining. That's the kind of a bit of an odd part, but we'll show you how so, so elegantly Satoshi's design created this mechanism that does both all at once. <clears throat> so there's kind of two types of mining. This is a very kind of debatable thing. People that see this will probably say, no, 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 Paul, you're all wrong. But with respect to those two goals of one, issue the currency, and number two, securing the network, you can consider proof of work and proof of stake, two kinds of mining. Many people would argue that proof of stake is not mining, but it solves some of the same goals and issues. But I'm mostly gonna to talk today about proof of work and give you a tiny bit of the, the compare and contrast between proof of work and proof of stake. But proof of work, it's simply, yes, expend energy, expend resources, and you get in exchange for that cryptocurrency. <clears throat> so what exactly is proof of work? What does it mean to expend the energy and get, um, and get the, the resource of Bitcoin and other cryptos? What you're doing is you're effectively playing a game. It's as simple as that. Many people have probably played Monopoly and you have a set of rules in that game and you play with a few different people. And if you play well and play better than everyone else, you effectively get rewarded in points. You roll dice and based on how you roll the dice, your little guy in Monopoly passes go and he collects 200. In a way, there's an aspect of odds there. You have a certain amount of odds of rolling dice and crossing go, and all of your competitors have a certain amount of odds of rolling dice and passing go. But whoever happens to pass go first collects the money. A good analogy to this is, as I put on the board, is a game of Sudoku. Who here has ever played Sudoku? Awesome, guess what? Today, we are gonna mine. And I'm actually gonna give out some Bitcoin for the person that mines the block. And our block is gonna be a Sudoku puzzle. So make sure you have, number one, a Bitcoin wallet. Edge is obviously a great op uh, option, edge.app to install. If you already have one, great, on your phone. And also make sure you have a computer out and a notepad. Because we are effectively all gonna be miners in this room today. And we'll start off with a Sudoku puzzle. So one of the nice characteristics of a Sudoku puzzle, and I give Andreas credit for this analogy because I first heard it from him, Andreas Antonopoulos, is that a Sudoku puzzle is somewhat hard to solve. And it can be made harder by making it bigger. But it's very easy to verify. You just simply add 
or look for the rows and columns and make sure they all have unique numbers going up and down and inside of the little boxes. And if they do have the right numbers and you have put in the correct answers, it can be easily verified by everyone else on the network. And if you're simply the first one to solve the Sudoku puzzle, then you're the person that receives that block, that block of Bitcoins. <clears throat> so hard to solve, easy to verify. It has a bunch of starting numbers, and then it has a bunch of numbers that you put in yourself. And it's also a problem that can be made harder. And that's where the difficulty comes in. <clears throat> the Bitcoin network wants somebody to solve the Sudoku puzzle every 10 minutes. That's specific to Bitcoin, it can change for different cryptocurrencies. Litecoin's two and a half minutes. Uh, some currencies, I think, Digibyte's 20 seconds or 15 seconds. So that's a tweakable parameter of a cryptocurrency. Specifically for Bitcoin, 10 minutes is what, is what it wants. But if there's more people trying to solve the Sudoku puzzle and faster people at solving the Sudoku puzzle, it happens faster. But the network keeps an eye on that. It says, hey, look, what's the last time that someone solved the puzzle? Okay, it was at 7.30 a.m. What's the next time somebody solved a puzzle? It was at 7.38 a.m., a little bit less than 10 minutes. And it takes that rolling average over the course of approximately two weeks and says, is everybody on the network faster or slower than 10 minutes? If they're slower on average, it makes the puzzle easier. If everyone's faster, it makes the puzzle harder. That's effectively it. Mining is playing a game against everyone else in the world that wants to play and expend energy. So let's play. Get your notepads out. We're going to solve a Sudoku puzzle. So just as a recap, this is a very simple Sudoku puzzle. The goal is to find numbers that fill the empty boxes that make it such that all of the rows only have one unique number, one, two, three, or four. All of the columns only have one unique number, one, two, three, or four. And all of the square boxes only have a unique number, one, two, three, or four. I'm glad all of you are trying, but I'm already going to just give you the answer. <laughs> this isn't the one that's going to win some Bitcoin. <laughs> so example, one, two, three, four at the top, easy to verify, right? You can kind of see and see that this is actually a solved block. Four, one, three, two, one, four, two, three, three, two, one, four. Great. That's the solution to the block. Now are you ready? Cool. $20 of Bitcoin to the person who can solve the puzzle first. Raise your hand as soon as you have the answer. And go. Is this a question or answer? So, so hopefully if someone actually saw my slides ahead of time, they might already have the answer to this. Because I was required to post. And if you're honest, you'll go ahead and and uh, not raise your hand immediately. But, I'll, but for those people that looked at the slides ahead of time, I'll give you a shirt. Okay. First hand up. What, what is your answer? Going across, so three and then the blank. And I believe that is correct. Three, two, four, one, four, one, three, two, one, four, two, three, two, three, one, four. Perfect. I didn't time that, but that I'm guessing that was about 40 seconds or so. The real network would actually time that. You'd have a timestamp at the point in time when you solve the puzzle, and everybody else would confirm that. Right? You can all view. And if you didn't get the right answer, they would call your bluff. And the next person who's continuing to work on the problem would effectively then get, re receive the reward. But all of you just basically operated a very close analogy to what mining actually is. Now, of course, on the Bitcoin network, we don't solve Sudoku puzzles. One thing you notice about the Sudoku puzzle is you're actually thinking about what proper numbers go into the slots. In Bitcoin, you're not thinking. You're literally just throwing numbers at the problem and seeing if they work. So to describe real mining, I have to kind of roll back a little bit and describe what exactly a cryptographic hash is. So I know that this is supposed to be a non-technical talk, but I'll try to describe it in a way that you can understand. A cryptographic hash is simply a fingerprint of data. You take one blob of data, for example, what you see on the left, 
and you pass it through what's called a function. In computer programming, it's just something that takes input data and returns some other data. And the, the behavior of this function is that every time you put the same data in it, you'll get the same data out. But you can't go in reverse. So I can't take a resulting data and know what the original data was. It's a one-way hashing function. I liken it to translating language. I can go from English to French, but what if I couldn't go back? What if I can go from English to Pig Latin, but I couldn't go back? That's effectively what a cryptographic function is, a, a, a cryptographic hashing function. And that's what we use in actual proof of work. So this looks a little scary, it looks a little developer-ish, but let's kind of an analyze each of these different blo blocks. In blue, we have what are called the given numbers. In a Sudoku puzzle, you have numbers that start the puzzle. You don't decide them, they're just there. Then you have the numbers that you put in yourself to see whether or not it's a right answer. Sudoku, you can kind of analyze and pick numbers yourself, but in mining, we literally just throw in a random number. We call that the nonce, the minor generated nonce, and everyone at the same time is just quickly throwing in random numbers. And then you take both of those, put them together, starting numbers and your guess, and you pass them through the hashing function, and you get, you get a resulting value. So that's the orange box, that's the resulting value. But how do you know if you've won? You know if you've won if that resulting value is simply less than what's called the difficulty. So I have a resulting value here of C27. Now this is what's called hex. It's not zero through nine, it's zero through 16, or zero through 15, I'm sorry. And we represent A, uh, we represent the, the numbers 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 as letters. Imagine the world had, uh, humans had 16 fingers as opposed to having 10. The reason we're used to one through 10 or zero through nine is because we have 10 fingers. In mathematics and some in computer science, we represent things as powers of two because that's how computers work. So C as a letter is less than D. So the network always has a level of difficulty. Just like I said, the Sudoku puzzles can get bigger and bigger and bigger we represent the level of difficulty in Bitcoin mining as just simply a number. And you, do, you have to find a resulting hash that's less than that number. So if the current network difficulty is D and a bunch of zeros, then anything that's lower than that solves the puzzle. And if I wanna make it harder and harder, I just lower the difficulty because now there's less numbers that fit the requirement of being less than uh, the difficulty number. So in that, Oops, I'm gonna go backwards here. In this example, the, this miner generated their guess, this nonce of two, three, D, A, F, you know, just a little bit of data, slapped them together, threw it through the hash function, and once again, you don't know what's gonna result on the other side, threw it into the hash function, re received this C27 value, and because C was less than D, they actually got the solution, and they mined the block. So, we could do this as well. We can mine. If you anyone have a phone or computer, and we'll give out another $20 of Bitcoin here. If you go to SHA-256, which is the hashing algorithm we create, .edge.app, it should look kind of like this, where you can put in a little blob of data and you get a resulting value. So remember the starting numbers, numbers of Sudoku? I'll give you the starting numbers, one, four, three. We love mining, don't we? And your job now is to pick two numbers, zero, one, zero, two, one, three. Once again, you can't think about the answer. It's just a random guess. Put in two numbers and then click that button to calculate the hash. And if you find a zero at the very beginning, then you've won. This might take a little bit longer, but who, has anyone found the solution? Remember, it's one, four, three, and you pick two numbers. You don't have to do the A through F, it's a zero or one at the, at the end. Two digit, two numeral digits. So one, four, three, and two numeral digits. I guess it might take about a minute for someone to solve it. But this is what true, I'm sorry? You're trying to not match this, you're trying to find a resulting value that has a zero at the beginning. 
Got it already. Okay, cool. Which ones do you have? One six. Can anyone verify that? One four three one six. Yes. Does anyone disagree? You have a one three. Agree. 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 Interestingly enough, does anyone have a different result? Exactly. One four. So there's more than one right answer. Unlike Sudoku, there actually can be more than one right answer, but it's simply the first person to get it. So good job. Got a little $20 worth of Bitcoin. But that is almost exactly the analogy of mining. You can't really think about what the answers are. You just throw it in there. And when you think about what are good miners versus miners that don't do well, it's the ones that actually have the com computational power not to guess the number, but the computational power to verify it. Because as you were doing, you're entering probably 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, it took you time to, to check. Took you time to click calculate and then check. And that calculate button is doing this mathematical function of generating the hash. The faster you can do that, the faster you can mine. <clears throat> cool. So we talked about the issuance of the network and the kind of creation and how you compete in this game of mining. And you know, that has that analogy to digging up gold. But we didn't talk about is how in the world does it secure the network? Like what is this actual analogy of securing the network? And this is where it kind of breaks between mining gold, because really once you've mined gold, the network is you holding gold and giving it to someone else. That is the payment network in actual regular mining, but it's not the same in Bitcoin. So with Bitcoin, people create transactions. This isn't kind of a, a course on, on tra transaction creation. But they create transactions, they sign them, and they broadcast them to the network. And a transaction is a combination of where money is coming from, kind of an account number, where money is going to, another account number, an amount, and then a digital signature. And if anyone attended the, the class yesterday on the history of cryptography, that actually gives you a good idea of how digital signatures are created. But if you think about that, source account, destination account, amount, and a signature, it looks a whole lot like a check, right? like a digital check, except the signature is digital, and you don't put a name, you put a number. Well, how do we validate in the real world that that check is valid, like the person actually has the money? Deposit it, it goes into the bank, the bank has their ledger, they have their list of accounts and balances, and they look at whether or not there's enough money in that account. And if there is, they can see also the ledger of the destination account, and then they effectively increment that. But it's effectively the bank doing that, and you just trust them that they're not going to add a zero or remove a zero in that transfer. <clears throat> so how do we secure the network in Bitcoin? Well, remember that blue box that said, you know, given numbers? They just, in, in Sudoku, they're just kind of magically there. And when you mine using the hashing function, I just gave it to you, 143. Well, in Bitcoin, the given numbers are actually a big blob of all of the transactions that people have sent on the network that are not yet confirmed. <clears throat> They're what we call the pending transactions or the mempool. So if you've ever sent a, a Bitcoin transaction and you notice it wasn't yet confirmed. The other party said, well, I see it, but I'm waiting for a confirmation. Or you send it to an exchange, and they say, it's waiting for confirmation, you can't quite use it yet. It's in this state called kind of unconfirmed, pending, or in the mempool. And there's potentially tens and thousands of these transactions that are in the mempool. A miner's job is, unlike the Sudoku puzzle that you guys kind of solved, or that 143 that I gave you, a miner can actually choose the starting numbers themselves. They choose which transactions they want to include in their Sudoku puzzle. And their process of choosing the transactions is based on whether or not they believe the transactions are valid. So they get to look at every single transaction and say, okay, here's the source account and here's the amount. Does it have enough money? If it has enough money, I believe this is a valid transaction. That's one of the main rules, but there's many other rules on the Bitcoin network. This is what we call the consensus mechanism of Bitcoin. 
each of the miners say, is this transaction valid in multiple different ways? Does it have enough of a mining fee? And if it chooses that transaction, it puts it into its list of transactions that it's going to use to start the Sudoku puzzle. <clears throat> and it takes that giant blob, and it also applies, remember that hashing function? It's that fingerprint of data. It applies that hashing function to it. And it says, let me go and get that hashing function and turn it into a small little fingerprint of all the transactions that I think are valid. Now that starts my puzzle, and I go and try to solve it. So in essence, every miner is actually solving possibly a different puzzle. One of the main reasons that makes it a different puzzle is it's a distributed network. If one person here decides to broadcast a transaction to all the miners, one miner right next to them is already trying to mine, say, one transaction. They've already created a Sudoku puzzle for themselves, and they're already trying to solve the puzzle. But then they receive another transaction from someone else. And in that transaction is a fee that the miner can take. So they say, well, I'd like that fee, so I'm going to include it into my Sudoku puzzle, and I'm going to change the starting numbers of my Sudoku puzzle, and then I'm going to continue to try to mine. So they're actually changing the puzzle as they're trying to solve the problem. Now, many people think, well, that's crazy. I'm working on a Sudoku puzzle, and you're changing it from underneath me. How am I ever going to solve it? Except remember, you're not actually trying to find the solution by thinking of the puzzle and looking at the starting numbers. You're just throwing a random number at it. Monkeys could be mining. You're just throwing a number at it. So it doesn't matter if the starting numbers are changing. Just keep throwing numbers until you find one that matches. And by incorporating new transactions as they come in, you're able to get more fees. In reality, on at least the Bitcoin network, generally speaking, there is a giant pool of transactions that have been broadcast potentially hours ago. Because there's limited space, miners effectively get to pick within all of those transactions which ones they want to include. And generally speaking, the number one thing that they choose is what has the biggest fee. Because I get what's called a block reward. I didn't even talk about that yet. But you get a fee for every transaction that's included in your block. And that is part of the reward. That is part of the Bitcoin you receive. But more importantly today, the biggest part of the reward is what's called the, just the simple block reward. When you just solve the block, regardless of there being any transactions or any fees, you get a block of Bitcoin. And in Bitcoin, at least, this is once again very different for other currencies. With Bitcoin, when it was started in 2010, that block reward was 50 Bitcoin, which sounds crazy huge today, but obviously back then it was worth nothing. And so people would mine just because it was fun and it was a gimmick and they were interested in the technology. You were mining basically worthless digital tokens. And roughly every four years, or a certain amount of number of blocks, that reward gets cut in half. So it got cut in half in 2013, I believe, um, to 25. And right now it sits at 12 and a half Bitcoin for every block that's mined, roughly every 10 minutes. And once again, these rules change. Um, the most amount that will ever get mined is 21 million, or actually not exactly 21 million, but close to that as you half and half and half and half. And at one point in time, there will only be one Satoshi mined per block. Um, and a Satoshi, in case not aware, is a hundred millionth of one Bitcoin. It just keeps getting halved and halved and halved, and it's expected to be about 120 years, 140 years, until we get to the point where the last block is mined of value of just one Satoshi. <clears throat> but getting back to securing the, the transactions, you know, a key piece of the reward is not just that block reward, but also the fees. And you as a miner get to choose. And this is actually one of the um, challenges of the network is because miners can choose and they choose the highest fees, it becomes a very open market for fees. And whoever puts the biggest fees gets in, but therefore small value transactions have a harder, uh, harder chance of getting in. If you're sending a value that is a, uh, not a significant percentage above the fee, then you're paying a high percentage. This actually explains what really frustrates people about uh, cryptocurrency is an unfamiliarity with how fees are calculated. For miners, they're expending energy, right? They're solving the Sudoku puzzle. That's one of their primary costs. But there's a secondary cost as well, is they have to hold the blockchain. They also are a full node. They hold the blockchain. And each of these transactions that comes through, they have to process. They have to go look at you know, the, the source account and the destination account. But one of the inherent 
parts of a transaction that the miner actually doesn't care much about. There's no impact to my cost as a miner is how much you're sending. Are you sending 100 Bitcoin or are you sending one Bitcoin? To me as a miner, that has no implications as my cost of operating my business. What does have implication is how much data in your transaction I have to process. So in Bitcoin, like I gave the analogy of a Bitcoin transaction looks like a source account, a destination account, and amount. In reality, it's source accounts, amounts, destination accounts, and amounts. You can actually source multiple different accounts with different amounts each, and you can send to multiple different destinations with multiple amounts each. However, a transaction that sources multiple accounts and goes to multiple other accounts is just a bigger transaction. It's more data. It's more stuff that I, as a miner, have to calculate. And it's more data that occupies the space of what's called a block size. So there's one of the rules in this Satoku puzzle, which is what's the maximum size of, of transactional data that I can incorporate? And in Bitcoin, that's one megabyte every 10 minutes. So if you were gonna send a transaction, there's this pool of transactions that I, as a miner, I can pick from. If you're gonna create a transaction that's huge, has a lot of inputs, you know, the source accounts, a lot of outputs, destination accounts, then for each, for each byte, you know, kilobyte or byte, little bit of data, I'm gonna want more money than someone that sent, or for, for the whole transaction, I will want more money than if you sent me a small transaction. Think about this as like a cash register. You're paying someone at you know, the local uh, McDonald's to process a transaction for someone to give them a, a $20 bill and return give food. You have to pay them, say minimum wage, eight, $10 an hour. If someone came in and gave them a $20 bill and they had to return change to that person, that cashier will take maybe 60 seconds to process the transaction. If someone came in instead and gave them 2,000 pennies, how long would it take that cashier to process the transaction? Probably more than a minute. It's the same thing with Bitcoin. If you're asking this miner to process a transaction, but that transaction has a bunch of pennies as its inputs, then it's gonna take the miner a longer period of time and he's gonna want more money for it. So in a way, McDonald's would want you to pay more for that Big Mac. They don't, but they'd want you to. And almost certainly, if everyone walked into McDonald's and paid 2,000 pennies for everything that they wanted to buy, they would have to up the price of a Big Mac. That's exactly what miners are doing, is they're simply upping the price because you're making them expend more energy to process a transaction. <clears throat> so these hashing algorithms, kind of going into a bit of the cryptography, the hashing algorithms, algorithms that exist, there's many of them in the world. SHA-256 happens to be one of the most popular ones, and I'm just gonna rattle off a few other names that you might come across and why these other ones exist. So SHA-256 was the original one that was chosen by Satoshi for Bitcoin. Uh, there have been forks of Bitcoin. If you're interested in what exactly is a fork, I'm giving a talk tomorrow on forks at the same time. But Bitcoin Cash is a fork, Bitcoin SV, there have been a bunch of others, Bitcoin Pizza, Bitcoin Diamond, blah, 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 that have forked off Bitcoin. Other chains have had forks, um, but those still use the same hashing algorithm of SHA-256. Um, one of the most popular set of coins that had forked from Bitcoin was uh, Litecoin in, I think, 2012 uh, or 2013. And it fundamentally wanted to change the hashing algorithm from SHA-256. <clears throat> and it used one called S-Script. Fundamental difference is the requirements of a computer to calculate that hash, to go from the starting data to the fingerprint. SHA-256 is incredibly efficient, it's incredibly fast, and it can be done by very, very small, tiny computers, and you just, do, you just have thousands of these computers. Parallel processing. Easily done by GPUs and what are called ASICs, dedicated chips. Um, and I'll talk a little about the trade-offs there, but S-Script was designed as one that needed not just a really powerful CPU, but a lot of memory. So when you buy a computer or a laptop, there's a few specs you look for the CPU, the Intel is at i9, clock speed, but then you also get the RAM. That RAM tells you how many programs you could be running at the same time. And RAM doesn't scale nearly as well as, as CPU cores, you know, four core, eight core clock speed. 
So by introducing uh, S-Script, um, we created a hashing algorithm that required more memory. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the goals of that in a second. And here's some other ones, you know, Blake, Blake 2, SHA-3, which was uh, kind of the successor to SHA-2 or SHA-256, and Grostal. And you'll see this if you're looking at mining various different coins. They use different hashing algorithms, and so therefore it needs different software and sometimes different hardware. <clears throat> so why were some of these new different hashing algorithms brought about in the first place? Well, there's this common term you might hear about in the mining world of ASIC resistance. Is it good or is it bad? Hugely debatable of it being good or bad. Well, SHA-256, being a very simple algorithm to convert a bit of data into a fingerprint, um, is easy to implement in a dedicated chip. Right now we have what are called general purpose computers. That's what you have on your laptop, on your phone. They can kind of do math on anything. But as you know, if you're a jack of all traits, you're a master of none. And that's what our computers do. They're the jack of all traits. They can compute anything, but they don't do anything one, one thing really well or, or really efficient. So, in, so over time, to become better miners, to be able to solve the puzzle faster, ASICs were developed, and they were the master of one. They could do only one thing. They could do that SHA-256 really, really, really fast. The benefit of that is it made it such that in order for attacking of the network to occur, like if someone wanted to create false transactions, they would have to acquire very specialized hardware. You couldn't just do it with kind of off-the-shelf computers. The disadvantage of ASICs is that regular people couldn't mine anymore. You couldn't use your computers, your phones, you know, your graphics cards, whatnot. You needed to buy very, very specialized equipment, of which cost thousands of dollars, and once they became out of date, they were just bricks. You couldn't use them to do anything else. They were the master of one. And once they became the master of one, but very slow at it, they were really useless. So there's a lot of, um, I don't know, like skepticism, but more negative sentiment around ASICs. They did change also the fundamental economics of mining. So mining is a zero-sum game because everybody in the world that's mining is mining for, for that same block. And the people who are fastest get that block and the people who are slowest don't. But as people get better at it, the difficulty increases. You have to expend more energy and more energy. So mining trends to costing the same amount globally as the reward. So if the reward is 50 Bitcoin every 10 minutes, and say Bitcoin was worth $1,000 for simplicity, that's $50,000 every 10 minutes. That is the global revenue of all miners in the world. That's the global possible revenue that you could have, which means if your cost of doing business is higher than that globally, then you're losing. And so really, there's just a small portion of people in the world that are profitable, and everyone else is paying their cost. So realize that as, as you kind of think about entering the space. It's a zero-sum game, because it self-balances to be zero. It wants it to be break-even over time, and you have to have a competitive advantage. So ASICs are a competitive advantage for the people that can get to them. <clears throat> now, what is kind of the inherently good thing? Most people don't say they're good at all. But what's inherently good? The good thing about it is that you have to have that specialized hardware, and you can't just use mass, mass computers. In the world of non-ASIC mined currencies, ones that use weird hashing algorithms that can't be implemented or have not yet been implemented in ASICs, um, they can be mined with just general computers, sometimes even the browser. And what we've seen is some of those currencies get attacked with what are called botnets which is malware running on millions of people's computers. They don't even know that the malware is running because it's not like crashing the computer, stealing the data, but it's literally mining some cryptocurrency. And that cryptocurrency is at more risk because hashing power from all these computers can shift from mining one currency to another. And the, I talked about the securing of transactions. I didn't talk about so much the attack. If you wanted to attack a network, what you would do is effectively mine invalid transactions. Have enough of the computing power to change the rules. And 
if enough of people in the room, you know how we kind of solve the Sudoku puzzle, and a few people said, yes, I agree, I agree, I agree. But what if two thirds of the room all said, you know something, we're actually gonna say that this solution to Sudoku puzzle works even though it really didn't. And we'd all disagree with each other. And then suddenly we've changed the rules of the game. That's effectively an attack on the network. And since the network doesn't count people, it actually counts energy. It actually counts um, effort to solve a puzzle. It's not counting how many people. You aren't voting with your individual presence. You're voting with um, your ability to solve the puzzle, your computing power. So having, ASIC resist, uh, having an ASIC uh, mineable currency has some benefits in that regard, in that you can't just take regular computers from all over the world and suddenly attack a network. But at the same time, it has that disadvantage of only allowing big, huge players to kind of enter the mining game. And so what's this kind of effect on the, uh, the kind of global energy of the world? So if you want to be, com oops, did I miss a slide here? Yeah. So if you want to be competitive, cheap energy is really key. Um, as well, cheap cooling, because computational power just generates heat, and you need to be able to cool it. But there's an interesting uh, effect on the global energy world uh, caused by mining, is that a lot of people criticize Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies for just sucking up energy all over the world and wasting it just to create a currency. But one thing they don't realize is that there is an, actually a very large excess capacity of energy. And its problem is it's not usable where it's generated. It could be not usable because it's generated at a time when people don't need it. Say in the middle of the night. If you've got a power plant feeding an entire city, the cost of turning on and off of that power plant is incredibly high. So what do you do? You just leave it on. And then at a time when people aren't using it, it just goes to waste. As well, solar farms. You could put a solar farm in the middle of, for example, the US where there's no one there. But how do you actually use that energy? You have to transport it over incredibly thick, huge copper lines or put it in a battery, which is also incredibly expensive. What proof of work mining allows you to do now is take excess energy anywhere in the world and so long as you can run an internet connection to it, you can make it profitable. That's one thing that people forget about. It really is a way of taking illiquid energy and making it liquid and making it valuable. And we're seeing this happen right now. <clears throat> so how to be competitive? I think I kind of covered it in the previous slides. So it's a little bit inverted. If you're even remotely thinking of mining, you'll need one of three main competitive advantages. One, energy, access to cheap energy however way, shape, and form, government subsidy in some cases, whatever, um, cheap cooling, be somewhere cold, a lot, of, a lot of mining happening in Iceland, Greenland. And number three, especially because many currencies have a, a simplified hashing algorithm, such as SHA-256, Bitcoin specifically, and ASICs are now built around them, access to cheap a ASICs, because that becomes a significant amount of your total cost of your business of, uh, as a miner. Usually pe people think of it as the cost of electricity, but you have to realize that as ASICs are so specialized, they cost a lot more per chip than say a general purpose computer that you could sell to millions of people. You're not gonna sell as many of them, and so your economies of scale are worse, so you're gonna charge a lot more. And that goes into your total cost of mining. <clears throat> if you don't have at least one of these competitive advantages, preferably three, you probably shouldn't even think about mining because there's someone else that's basically taking your loss because it's a zero, zero sum game. <clears throat> so touching a little bit on the um, difference in proof of stake and proof of work. So proof of work is what we've primarily been talking about this entire time. It you know, issues the currency and secures the network. <clears throat> so what exactly is proof of stake and how does it compare? Well, proof of work is you expending energy, usually denoted in native government currency, dollars. You're paying people, you're, you're buying ASIC uh, hardware, you're paying for your electricity bill in dollars or euro, wherever you happen to be. It's not really denoted in the native currency. Right? So you're expending some amount of value to say, I'm gonna make sure that those transactions I include in my Sudoku puzzle are real. And if I'm wrong, I don't win money. So I'm losing money if I say the wrong thing. <clears throat> but what's proof of stake? Proof of stake is still expending value, but instead of expending it 
live, on the fly, burning energy, you're expending it via risk. You're saying, I'm gonna take some of this cryptocurrency and I'm gonna put it on the table, it's an ante, like you're in Vegas. I'm gonna put it on the table and I'm gonna say, I am going to confirm correct transactions. And if I don't, then my money goes away. It's like everyone in the room just basically puts up a Bitcoin, equivalent to this is puts up a Bitcoin, and almost round robin, or one of us gets to choose, the network chooses, you tell, us, you tell me right now what are the right transactions, you say so. And everyone else verifies. And if they all disagree with you, you lose that ante that you've put up. That's effectively proof of stake. The difference though, is that we're not expending any actual energy there. We're just putting funds at risk. Um, there's benefits, pros and cons of each. I'm not here to say like one is a scam and one is not, although there's many people that are very opinionated and you know, have very idealistic views in one way or another, but I think there's just significantly different trade-offs. One of the biggest trade-offs is the fact that proof of stake is denoted in the cryptocurrency. It has almost nothing to do with the dollar value. It's denoted in the cryptocurrency. And so therefore, if you have a lot of the cryptocurrency, regardless of its value, you can effectively control the network versus having a lot of money independent of the cryptocurrency to spend on mining, hardware, people, electricity. So if the value of the cryptocurrency were to plummet, drop, get dumped on, manipulated to a low value, then someone with a lot of that cryptocurrency could immediately falsify transactions because they effectively get to decide. They become the two-thirds of the room because they have a lot of cryptocurrency to put at stake. The more you put at stake, the more of a vote you have. Um. <clears throat> cool, and that's it. Hope that helps everyone kind of have a better understanding of what mining is. I know that when I first introduced someone into Bitcoin and crypto, this is their biggest question, like the, their biggest mystery to them. is like, how in the world does this magic money just kind of come out of nowhere? I just launch my computer and get money. How could that really be money? You know, who's backing it? And so, you know, the biggest answer I always have is that nobody's backing it, and that's its beauty. No one really backs gold, that's its beauty. No one backs Bitcoin. What's backing it is the energy that's put into finding it, the energy that's put into verifying it. And in the case of proof of stake, the money that people are putting on hold to promise that those transactions are valid. So thanks everyone, happy to take any questions.